The Creatives with AI podcast. The spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Hey, Alan, how you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, very good, Dave. Great to, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no worries. So you've written a pretty interesting book about AI in business and in the workplace. Do you want to maybe give a little bit of a, an overview of what the book is about? Yeah, sure. Um, so Harnessing the Power of AI in Organizations um, is a book that I guess really evolved through last year. Um, I sort of, I've been sort of following the AI space for, for a very long time, actually, since I was a kid. Maybe we'll, we'll dig into that a bit later. But um, I just sort of felt that with GPT uh, 3.5 coming out, um, it sort of suddenly gave us a tool perhaps that we'd never seen before. You know, it was something that up, up until then, any other kind of chatbot or um, similar kind of AI tool, if you tried to use it, you know, you kind of put something in, you nine times out of 10 get something almost unusable out. And suddenly here's this thing that, you know, actually this can, this can really do some, some, some serious stuff. But, but it wasn't even the fact that it was so good that made me start to think, I really need to think, think deeply about what AI does in organizations. Um, it was the fact that what it, what I knew it would become as well, you know, and we're not even there yet. We're just, be we're just beginning this journey, but you know, I could see immediately when I looked at it. Yeah. Okay. This is already now actually something that's, that's very good. Um, five years from now, 10 years from now, where are we going to be? And I immediately kind of flash back to, you know, when I sort of first started my career and the internet kind of came along and, you know, if we think back, if I put you in front of the internet as it was then in sort of 1994 today, you'd kind of go, well, this is pretty clunky and janky, you know, <laughs> you know, but I think we could all see at the time what it, what it was going to be and its potential. And of course, within sort of six, seven years, you know, by the time we got to sort of 2000, we had this thing that was, you know, had really turned business and organizations inside out. And as soon as I saw GPT from OpenAI, I thought, yep, this is another one of those moments. And I need to think deeply about how this is going to affect organizations. So, so the book kind of started to be formed, um, I said at the beginning of last year. And I sort of, I, th I guess I had it done by about August. And then went into sort of, you know, proofreading and, you know, just editing and down and stuff like that. But and fundamentally, it was about what are the principles here? What what are the things um, that businesses need to start thinking about? Because this is not, I guess, an IT problem. And I think there's a there's a sort of initial gut reaction to, that people have when they think about AI is what's an IT thing. Um, but actually, this is an organizational problem in the same way as the Internet wasn't really an IT problem. It was an organizational problem. You know, everyone from the post room. Uh, through to marketing, through to HR, whichever department you're in in an organization in you know 1994, things were changing because of the internet. And I think that's exactly where we are now with AI. So I sort of worked through the book. Um, and as I went through it, I kind of developed, I, go, I suppose, a framework for how organizations should react and behave with this kind of new world that's coming, how they should catch the wave, if you like, because it very much felt to me like there was a you know, a tidal wave coming. And, and if you, if organizations hadn't thought this through, you know, they become the next Kodak, basically, um, or the next blockbuster, you know, the world passes them by the ones that grasp yeah. it, move on, and suddenly, you know, they're kind of looking around going, well, what happens? It's, you're absolutely right. And it's interesting that you say that, because I think we, do you think we learned anything from the internet revolution? Because I think a lot of businesses initially got left behind. And I think the, the businesses that really leaned into the internet and, and using the internet and figuring out how to use it and how to make their business better probably gained a, a big advantage at the time. And so I guess my question is, do you think we actually learned anything from that? And do you think, do you think businesses as a whole are actually leaning into AI or do you think a lot of them are still quite scared of it? I think it's still very early days, actually. Um, and that's something I try and make an assessment of a lot um, with AI Your Org when I, when I talk to organizations and stuff um, and through through my network. And, you know, I, I talk to organizations that are really are really grasping it and are really going for it. And I think that they probably possibly have learned from, you know, from the uh, the, the dot com, as it were, uh, boom and bust. Um, I mean, just circling back to that, I mean, back in those days, you know, there were a lot of organizations that, as you say, didn't grasp it and, and very quickly sort of went out of uh, business. Almost overnight, they became legacy companies. And I think, you know, we have the same thing now where, and it was a thought that went through my mind when, you know, OpenAI launched GPT was, you know, well, suddenly a lot of businesses have become legacy companies, really. Um, and if you look at the kind of landscape today, there aren't many big companies from back then 
that are dominant now, you know, um, if at all. I mean, in, you know, Amazon are, are the big sort of retailer, aren't they? And if you think back to the sort of 90s, well, it was really on the street, wasn't it? You know, it was the Debenhams and, you know, it, John Lewis's and all of that. So those so things really did shift. And those legacy businesses never really grasped it quick enough. You know, blockbusters went to the wall because of Netflix. And, you know, I, so I, I wonder if we'll see something similar this time, whether... The legacy, the companies that are around today suddenly become the legacy companies and they don't grasp. I would hope that they will. And that was really the purpose of the book was to kind of sort of, I suppose, shout out to organizations and say, wake up, because the time doesn't stand still. This is going to move incredibly fast. And if you're not prepared to change, you know, you, well, you know, often organizations can fear change or individuals can fear change. But, you know, they're going to they're going to find becoming irrelevant far more scary, uh, I think, than, you know, worrying about resisting change. So. I don't know, I think is the answer. And when I talk to companies at the moment, I think a lot of them are still kind of watching, if that makes sense. It's sort of, this is still quite new. So it was kind of, well, this thing happened last year. There was this kind of, you know, AI earthquake, if you like. And now we're just kind of waiting for the dust to settle to see which way it's going to go. And I think some companies are afraid to invest at this point because they're they're nervous that, well, what if we invest in the wrong thing or the wrong technologies? or And it's almost, we want things just to kind of settle a little bit before we're prepared to kind of, you know, put boots on the ground as it were and really really go for this so i i think you know in that cycle um and probably in the book i described there's probably like a three-year moment from when something happens to when really things start to become ubiquitous in organizations and they start to really grasp it i think we're about 18 months into that three year and i think by by another 18 months time i think organizations will start appointing things like you know they'll have a director for ai right so yeah. you know or, yeah. or, or you know yeah or chief AI you know, officer or whatever. Um, we, we're not quite seeing that yet. But when you listen to the, the kind of big consultancy firms, you know, that's exactly what they're saying as well. You know, that this is what companies need to get to. They need to put somebody in the business thinking about AI across an organization, not not somebody from IT or somebody from marketing. Or it needs to be somebody across the whole organization that is connected to all, yeah. the, all the business departments and can really help to drive it through. Yeah, that's right. And what what types of companies? I mean, I I know you. Is it you work with the chartered mechanical engineers or something? Sorry, I, don't, yes, the I know there's a lot of different engineering ones, and there's tons right, of like yeah. little letters yeah. after Thir your name. Thirty six, um, in fact, <laughs> something um, like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're the institution of mechanical engineers, and I'm um, head of global membership development for them. Um, right. So the companies that you're talking to are those mainly engineering firms, or are you talking to people sort of across the board? Um. Quite broad spectrum, actually, for, for two reasons. Um, through IMAKI, yeah, predominantly engineering organisations um, that I would be speaking to. Although, of course, I do come into contact day to day with people from other other you know worlds as well. Um, but then through my own um, AI network, I have a, an AI network called AI Org, um, and yeah, I mean, I guess everyone involved in that uh, and on that network, they're from a real range of backgrounds. You know, you've got solicitors, lawyers teachers you know um we've got you know media people marketers um photographers videographers all sorts you know so it's a so i'm getting getting sort of fairly good high level conversations with people in, in all different sectors really um and it is a similar pattern there's 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 a, i can't see at the moment any particular sector that i'd say oh they've really got this you know i think everyone is still kind of sort of swimming around a little bit and trying to understand what, quite what to do with it they're not they're not sure yet um but like i said i think i think you know that's a that's a three-year journey um you know and i think in another 18 months we'll be in a position where i think you'll start to see the companies that are doing this well and you'll start to see the kind of rewards that they're gaining and then perhaps they're gaining some some market share and some getting getting ahead of their competitors a little bit do you think we've reached the peak of the hype cycle hmm. Honestly, do you think there's still some room to go because yeah this is i the mean my, cycle my feeling is, is yeah my my feeling is that we We've kind of reached the peak. It almost feels like we're now starting to come down into the trough of disillusionment. And I think that's that's being driven by, at least in my opinion, it feels like that's being driven by a lot of the lawsuits that are coming out around copyright and all the other stuff. So that's made some people that maybe were rushing into it. It might have slowed down some of those organizations that were rushing to think, oh, hang on, maybe we need to just wait a second and pause and see what's going on. So that's kind of made me think that maybe we've crested that hill, but I don't know. You're talking to different people, so I'm interested to see what you think. Um, I mean, I, I have I've looked at that cycle quite a bit actually over the last year, as you can imagine. Um, and some days I think we have, and some days I think we haven't. 
Um, and I think a lot of that depends on what comes next in terms of the development in the AI sector. So I think if we said, OK, 18 months from now, the kind of tools that we're using are, are roughly the same as what we've got today, um, albeit perhaps, you know, sort of refined or fine tuned, then perhaps we are getting to the, you know, the peak of the, the hype cycle. But I still think there's the potential in the next 18 months, two years to see some applications that are really game changing that suddenly drop in that suddenly everyone goes oh wow okay now we can do this and that could you know actually kind of drive it so i'm not sure you know i understand gartner cycle and they've applied it to previous um technological breakthroughs and you know if you looked at it you looked at the you know, the internet um or mobile you know phone technology through the, that sort of hype cycle it probably works and it possibly will this time as well but i think it's not 100 percent. i think we could see um, things kind of ramp up again. I, I guess the one thing I often think about with with all of this is that you know we we saw we're sort of at a place at the moment where I think often people look at AI and kind of go right this is it is it this is what it does I understand it and and I can do X Y and Z with it. I think people forget that you know this is the this is the Sinclair ZX spectrum of of of, of my childhood exactly. right you know yeah, and exactly. you know in 15 20 years time <laughs> you know we would have moved on considerably so you know we are at the dawn of this technology in that sense although ai has been around since the 50s and you can go back to you know marvin minsky and john mccarthy and all of those yeah you know and the, the the early sort of neural networks and then all through the 90s you know you've got ibm's chess computers and doing all of that um, you know, and then you get to 2012, you know, and you've got, you know, uh, AlexNet and the, the, all, all the kind of stuff that was going around that and developing deep learning. I, I think, you know, but despite all of that, with the transformer stuff that we've just kind of got to, um, that's, a, you know, this, this is kind of a new dawn. Now, whether we go from here, it, there's another new dawn every six months, every year, I don't know. Um, Possibly not. I mean, if you look at the sort of history um, of AI development, it's sort of gone in step changes and then there's a kind of lull and then there's another step change. And I suspect what, what we've got here with generative AI is that this, we have this step change from the, you know, the, the paper that's published by Google, 20 Century Transfer, you know, attention is all you need, the, the, which outlaid everything about transformer networks. We have this paper, it gets, the product gets developed, oh, ironically not by Google, but really by OpenAI, drive it. Um, they go public with it. Suddenly, we are where we are. I think we then spend the next five years now developing. We've got it's like we've got a new engine. It's kind of right. Well, what vehicles can we put this into, right? And we're now figuring out what those vehicles are going to be, right? And how it can power things and what it can do. And and I think over the next five years, we'll see some things that are really mind blowing. People will suddenly go, "Wow, oh, did you realize you could do this with it and and apply it to this technology or this process or this application?" And suddenly you, you're transforming things. Um, but I don't know that we see another step change in the way of going to, you know, generative AI was maybe for another 10 years. I mean, people keep talking about AGI. Yeah. I think I personally think that's quite a long way away. Um, and I think that what we do is we refine, we refine, refine. And then in the future, um, we move into this position where perhaps there's another big step change again. But at the moment, you know, and that may be visual. Um, you know, if you look at sort of, what we've got at the moment it's all language based um if you think about yeah. how a human brain works well most yeah. of the data a human gets is visual cortex That's so right. yeah. and we've we've not captured that in an ai system yet in, in any meaningful way so um even though we have things like computer vision it's not the same it's not yeah and that's um i was just in the last recording that i did that'll come out this week i was talking to someone about that and i said you know sort of these transformer models seem to learn a little bit like humans do but they're missing the visual aspect of that, because that's what gives a lot of the things that I think humans learn. We need the context that we see that goes with it to make us understand what we're actually hearing and what's happening. And, you know, that all those senses work together to give us that rounded understanding of, of what we're learning. And that's the one thing, like you said, that the, that AI doesn't have. So I, and I'll ask you about the future in a minute, but I want to, go on this thread because I see two things in the next 50 years that are going to change society enormously. And I think one's going to be quantum computing. I think I know they're doing baby steps and it's still very, very early R and D, but they will crack that eventually. And I think that's going to have a massive impact on 
what the computers are able to do. Because essentially these transformer models, like you said, you know, these are basically algorithms from the 50s that we just didn't have enough compute power to to have them work to their fullest potential. And if we increase the compute power by an, an order of a thousand or a hundred thousand, then that completely blows it out of the water. And what's going to happen then? I don't know. So that's one thing I think that'll have a huge impact. And the other one I think is, is, is I don't know how far away it's going to be, but if we can get fusion reactors working, then we eliminate the power aspect of it. And, you know, essentially we then have free, not free, but very low cost, unlimited power. And I think having that combined with quantum with everything that we learn in the next 10 to 20 years, like, I don't think that's anywhere in the next 10 years. Like we're, you know, we're 20, 25, 30 years away from that if society makes it that far. But um, I, I don't know. I see those as the two major, major things. And I don't know what order they'll come in. Like we may actually get working fusion before we get quantum computing. I don't know. It feels like quantum's going to come first to me. But I don't know. I don't, that, those seem like the, the major hurdles that were or the major things that are going to happen. Well, I think it's, it's a very interesting area. Um, and, and just to circle back to the, 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 the sort of language model, the differences between the sort of human perhaps and, you know, what, what the model can do. Um, you sort of touched on it was, you know, the, the key thing is that the, the current models don't have memorization, at least not persistent memorization. You know, they can remember a little bit through a conversation, maybe 20, 30 exchanges, but then it seems to sort of fade away. And the only way you can kind of get any memorization at the moment is to load a load of documents, but that just becomes part of a data set essentially. Um, so they lack this ability to understand the world as well. They don't have an understanding of physics or gravity or, or their world environment because they've got no visual data. Um, their ability to reason is limited um, and they've no real ability to plan either. You know, you can kind of get them to do a task, but then they can't sort of build off that, you know. So, um, but that can change over time. Uh, and as you say, maybe stacking up the data set gets us closer to that. That's, that's a possibility. Uh, I think the visual thing is is really key. I mean, if you if you look at so a data set for a, a typical large language model um, is somewhere in the order of you know um, ten to the power. I think this was ten to the power of uh, fifteen. And then you know a child at the age of by the age of four, just for its visual data, would have would have pulled in like ten to the power of seventeen, something close to that. So you know it sort of shows. The amount of information, but but that's not to diminish the size of the data set because actually, um, if you were to sort of sit and read that data set, the language model has it would take you one hundred and seventy thousand years. So yeah, you know, exactly, we yeah. shouldn't we shouldn't underestimate it either. But but the point being that you know, um, it's we we can keep building and we can keep building, but I think until we get to the kind of visual data as well, so until the model understands perhaps the world um, and the world that it's in, then I think it it remains limited. Um, I mean, if if you're in a if you're in a position in say twenty years time where you've got a quantum system, and it's running a a sophisticated AI model that's that's close to say AGI that understands visual data as well, um, I mean maybe that's terrifying possibly. Um, I don't know. I I think it's it's definitely a kind of there's, there's definitely gonna be a race to the top here though, and I think that you know one thing's for sure that the the, the sort of the big companies the the Microsofts and the open AI is that they're just going to keep pursuing, pursuing, pursuing this. We, I mean, we've talked about quantum. I mean, I remember talking about quantum computers back in the eighties, nineties, right? So this has been a long, and same for fusion, actually. You know, this has been a long time conversation. Yeah, um, they've and, been working on it for decades. Trying oh, to get yeah. It to, I, I mean, to, I, to twenty work. years ago, I was going into there's a there's a fusion um, system in in Oxford, uh, the Science Park there. Um, yep. Yeah. Brother yeah. Thurston Laboratories, and I I remember going in there twenty years ago and looking at the system. And they were saying to me then, I was 50 years away, all right? And if I ask some, you know, if I ask somebody now how far it's away, they're probably still going, well, you know, 40, 50, maybe. Um, so, they got it know, to hold for 46 seconds, I think, yeah. or 48 seconds, which in the last month, which was like a world record yeah. that, at 7 million degrees or something like that, which is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, I think it's, it's you know, and, th and they have proven now, I think it was about a year ago with Fusion, they proved that it could output more than you put into it which is obviously yeah. what you need to better do if you create yeah. energy so um so i think it i think it will come but i think it's still yeah it's not it's not it's not on the short-term horizon and you know if you're the government you're still building nuclear power stations at this point because you're not seeing this as a viable you know you're not going to switch switch out to fusion reactors anytime soon so 
so I, I, as to which gets there first, I mean, yeah, I think we need fusion. Uh, if we don't get to fusion, not just for AI, but in general, obviously for global warming and everything else, uh, it feels to me like a very important moment for humanity. Um, and in terms of su su you know supercomputers, quantum computers, that feels like a very worrying moment for humanity because they could potentially unravel everything that we built, you know, in terms of security. So <laughs> very quickly. Well, I think some of the compute that's come along has done that, you know, and, and we've managed to, to cobble along and stay ahead of it a little bit. So I think the limiting factor with quantum is, is will be the cost that I think what will happen is, is that the only companies that will be able to actually afford to properly use anything that's quantum will probably start off being the security companies. And what they'll do is they'll use it to create new security that people can't break through even using quantum. Um, but that's just a guess. I have no idea. So I don't think your average everyday hacker is going to have access to, to a quantum computer before the security companies will. So I'm okay. hoping that, you know, maybe they'll, they'll do that. But one of the things that you mentioned talking about big companies, I mean, you know, it's already starting to coalesce into a few of the giant tech companies. So yeah. how can smaller organizations maybe leverage AI to compete or to try and keep up? I think it's, I think it's really challenging actually. Um, and you know, we've seen it before, haven't we? When the internet came along, everyone was, this is great. It's going to democratize it. Every little retailer is going to, you know, be as, as powerful as the, as the big boys. And, and of course, what did we end up with? You know, Amazon, um, you know, almost one retailer, yeah. Yeah. um, you know, so I think that there, there's a real risk here and we're already seeing, I think with Microsoft, very aggressive in this space, um, buying up, you know, every AI company that shows anything with, with interest in the spark. I mean, they've just acquired inflection, uh, with Pi, which you interviewed, which, which I've also interviewed. Yep. Yep. Um, and we'll you know, talk about that later. Excellent. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I was gutted about that, I have to say, because I had a, a lot of fondness for, for inflection. And it just feels to me that, you know, okay, yeah, they've given Mustafa Suleiman his own, you know, gang now in, in London, they're going to they're gonna set up an AI centre there and develop stuff, which is great, I guess. But, um, you know, at the same time, it feels like the smaller companies are just going to get swallowed up. I, I've, have, I've not seen Apple go for anyone yet, but I'd imagine it's only a matter of time um, over the next few years is, is things that they think fit what they're trying to do, you know, come along, they'll just buy them up. So I think it's a big problem. Um, we, I mean, we saw it with the dot-coms and why we had the dot-com busts, you know, because there was a lot of organizations then that, you know, were trying to make it and had an idea. Um, but in the end, you know, it's it was the big companies that kind of, you know, formed and, you know, in the end, everything just seems to coalesce around a few big companies, whatever the the, the market is, whatever the subject is, you, you always seem to end up with two or three maybe dominant yeah. players in the space. You see it with but mobile just, technology. It's going to reshuffle it, isn't it? Which is what you're talking about with Amazon, right? So it did. You know, there was a small, you know, competitive company that, you know, new startup that came in that completely disrupted, you know, the book selling industry to start off with. I mean, if anybody remembers, Amazon used to sell books. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when I, they used to be a client of mine a long time ago, back in the 90s, before they even had AWS or even that whole side of the business. And, um, you know, they were still very much a small, you know, small website that was, that was trying to make it. And it, it was a, it was a reordering of who's at the top. And I suspect it, what you're saying is, is that we're going to see that again, right? Some of the older established companies that maybe don't, you know, they don't, they don't adopt it quickly enough, or maybe there's too many barriers and, and I can get your thoughts on that in a minute as well. But, you know, maybe there's too many barriers. They move too slowly. They can't actually get it to get like Apple, you know, they seem to be struggling to get something together. Now, whether, you know, at the, at the developers conference in June, if they announce something new, like maybe they have been working on something, but we don't know. Um, it's just going to be a reshuffling and there's, there's going to be opportunities and there's going to be gaps in there. I think for, you know, you've got companies like 11 labs that no one had ever heard of before who now is doing amazing voice, you know, AI using AI around voice and, and doing all sorts of stuff. You've got Hey Jen, who's doing amazing stuff around video and voice combined and, you know, Pi, for example, who's already been bought, but, you know, companies like that, that are going to start growing and coming out of nowhere. And they're just going to supplant some of the traditional companies you know, that, that we've always had. I, I really hope so. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm absolutely thinking that, you know, it'd be great if companies like 11 Labs and HN can, can resist the, the dollars. Um, yeah. We'll see, yeah. won't we? Time will tell. Um, you know, I think that, 
it, it's fun at the moment. I mean, it's, I was thinking about this yesterday. It's, it's, it reminds me of my kind of early computing days, you know, when I was sort of getting my first computers, um, say the, the, the Spectrum, you know, when I was sort of, you know, 11 years old. And, um, and it feels like the Wild West, you know, there's all these little companies coming up with these ideas and every day you see a new, a new tool or a new thing and you go, oh, I play with that and that's really cool. Um, and I, I hope it persists for a while at least because it's a lot of fun. Um, whether these organisations become the next dominant companies, I don't know. I mean, look, you know, back in the 80s, um, who were the big companies? You know, Microsoft, well, <laughs> they're still here. Um, you know, and yeah, yeah sure, they, they might have dipped a little bit during the kind of mobile uh, phase, you know, and maybe they didn't do as well as Apple and Apple kind of became the dominant power because of mobile um, through the iPhone and, you know, but now maybe now Apple are on a, you know, maybe I, I feel like Apple at the moment, by the way, are behind on AI. I, I know they'll announce yeah, something I at, agree. W, at WWDC. I've no doubt about that. But I think that the, the problem Apple have got is if you wanted to get into AI, right, and so you needed to start thinking about this 10 years ago. Well, 10 years ago, Apple were thinking about a headset and a car. They weren't thinking yeah. about AI. Yeah. And so they're behind Right. They've put so much investment into those things that they didn't give enough thought to this. And whereas, you know, OpenAI and Google were thinking about AI 10 years ago. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's why, we, why we've ended up where we are. But whether the I think the real the real star here, actually, and uh, they're already becoming uh, big enough for people to start hating them, actually, is OpenAI. But let's not forget, they are really a small little startup. Right. They um, well, yeah. You know, they're not one of the big, big boys. So, you know, the fact that they're still going and they sort of resisted the Microsoft takeover, although some people might say that they are kind of still run by Microsoft now. But um, the fact that they're still a, an entity, I think, in a way, is to be kind of celebrated because I think had they been swallowed up, had Altman gone to Microsoft, had that just become a Microsoft division and most of the staff went, which is kind of what happened at Inflection, um, yeah. you know, this aqua hire yeah. thing, it, it, that would have been a great shame. Yeah, and I think people need to remember the thing about OpenAI is you've got to remember that Sam Altman's a VC. He's not a technologist. Mm -hmm. He's a money guy. And um, that's something that I think a lot of people forget as well. He's not like a Zuckerberg who was a kind of a technologist to start yeah. off with and then became this kind of business person. I think Altman has always been a business person who's getting into this. And that's probably slightly um, unfair, but basically that's that's kind of what it is. Um, so what do you think are the most significant barriers to AI adoption for some of the, the traditional companies that you've come across anyway? The, the, the thing I always come across is um, they're worried about security and privacy data. Um, they don't know where the, the data goes. They don't know if what it's being absorbed into, if it's being used to train models. They don't know how secure what they're doing is. Um, it's a big problem. I, th there's some tech engineering tech companies that, that I've worked with. I won't name names because they wouldn't appreciate it if I did. But um, but they have basically said to their staff, you know, you're not using this stuff on site on our systems, um, and that you know things like open, you know, GPT or whatever, or they just won't allow it. Um, and and I think you know when I talk to the staff there, their comment would be, well, this is a problem for us because we feel like we're falling behind or we can't use these tools to develop in a, in the way we we could be developing technology so and i think an organization that adopts that sort of i suppose fairly conservative approach over time will fall behind because their, their staff just won't be using cutting edge tools um so i think companies need to find a solution to it but that that is the sort of single main reason um the, the other one that sort of always breaks through is is just they're they're nervous about investing in the technology i think you know sort of mentioned this earlier that well where do we put the investment we don't want to invest in the wrong thing or um, what if it says something that's really stupid to our customers or, you know, or, you, you know, and so I think there's just this kind of nervousness about, about the space. So they're just hesitance. Hesitancy is the, the biggest, the biggest problem. Um, you know, there is that fear there. And I, I completely get that, you know? So I think, you know, this is why, and in the book, I talk about this a lot about the fear factor. You've got to, you've got to, um, approach this with a very sort of balanced realistic view and then you've got to do things in a very measured way and you know you need to put in your own alignment you need to put in your own safety processes you need to make sure that you're not just kind of you know letting this stuff kind of roam free um in your organization it needs to be managed and, and done yeah. properly but i think organizations don't quite know how to do that yet no i i would agree and i've i've done some consulting with a few companies just around my local area and the the question they always have is most of them are quite curious and they're playing around, you know, trying different tools and, and different things to try and see how things work. But they're, what they 
generally seem to want to know is how should we be using this? And it's like my recommendation to them at the minute is, is for anything that's internal, it's probably okay to use. So if you're doing things like go write your own content, but then have it analyze the content and say, what does this actually mean? What summarize this for me? Is this, does this say what I think it says? Or, you know, you can use it to, to generate outlines or thoughts on, you know, certain topics. You can say, oh, what are the considerations I need to think about with X? And, you know, it's, the tools seem to be very good at that sort of thing to help you make sure it's like a business plan. You can say, you know, summarize a business plan for me. What should I have in it? And it'll give you a perfect, beautiful summary of all these different things. And then you can go into each chapter sort of, or each heading and you can start to say, okay, what consideration should I have here? And it used to write that. I don't know if you've noticed this, but certainly chat GPT used to just write the business plan for you. It doesn't do that anymore. Now it gives you outlines and suggestions on the things that you should put into a business plan. So they've obviously tweaked it in the background to not sort of give you the answer all the time. It sort of steers you in the right direction. And I think that's really valuable. So I use it a lot for those sorts of things. Or, you know, I can point it at your book and say, hey, what sort of questions should I ask somebody who's written a book about this? And it'll give me a, a great list of questions you know, and I can say, give me five of the best questions or give me a hundred questions. And then I can go through and go, oh, I didn't, never really thought about asking that. That's a good question. And then I can put it in my own words. And for me, that's where it feels like business can use it. I know there's some, and I've mentioned this on podcasts in the past, but there's some companies that are using like big advertising companies are using it to do some of the, the voice uh, cloning to do things like read business addresses in ads because no voiceover artist wants to read 14,000 addresses for a company, but they can literally just make a, a model of the, of the artist's voice and then they can just update the spreadsheet as needed and then the voice will just automatically put the addresses in and no one needs to do that. So for me, it's those sorts of really operational kind of tasks that seem to be the best use for it at the minute. And it's also, those are the things that really have an impact on the efficiency of the business, as opposed to like you were saying, like I would never leave a chat bot, just an AI powered chat bot facing the public. No. You know, we've seen loads of examples of that. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's not to the, it's not to the right point that you could do that. But internally, I think, you know, again, internally, I think is is where it's it's probably the most useful at the minute where you can kind of keep an eye on it. If I you think, know what I mean. you know, I, I look at the organization in a sort of very layered way, really. Um, and I think when I think about where it can be used, I mean, obviously, you've got the kind of back end stuff, the data, you need to sort your data and clean it all up. And then, but when you get to the front end stuff, um, you know, customer facing, yeah, you, you know, there's got to be some serious limitations there and what, what you're putting out at the moment. Um, and you need to be very, very 100% sure that it's not going to, you know, start arguing with your customers or, or, or worse, you know, sort of spouting bad language or, or racist, uh, you know, information or something like that, uh, as we've seen, you know, certain systems do in, in recent weeks. Um, and then, you know, organizationally with staff, you know, there's I think there's two things there. Yes, we could get staff using these sort of tools, and as you say, perhaps to brainstorm with them. And I think as a co-pilot, AI technology at the moment is amazing. Um, if I'm working on a project or an activity, the ability to brainstorm with it, um, figure out ideas, talk to it. I mean, sometimes I use Pi, I just chat to Pi, just to have a conversation with Pi and just to get, you know, some thoughts. Well, what do you think about this? Um, I think it's really powerful because, you know, it's it's almost like having a kind of tutor sat next to you that can give you the advice and guidance as, you, as you're going along. It doesn't subtract from what you're doing or your thoughts or your ideas, but it's, it's augmenting what you're doing, supporting it. Um, you know, and allowing you to perhaps abstract, you know, to, to a higher level faster um, to get to where you want. So, but but again, for staff to do this in an organization, you can't just dump them in front of a tool and go, well, there you go. Uh, all you need is prompt engineering, you'll be fine. They'll go, well, what's prompt engineering? I mean, you know, and I, mean, I don't like the word prompt engineering, it's just asking questions, right? Um, but the point being that, you know, as you work with an organization or with staff, you've got to you've got to guide them through this process really and think about where it's suitable and look at every part of the organization. Where is it suitable? Where is it not suitable? Where should we apply this? You know, you want to go for a mapping process really of all the different aspects of your organization, of the, the process flows that take place and think, well, where would AI fit within this? And then you almost need to review that a year later, two years later, because there'll be new tools that 
you know, two years ago, you couldn't augment exactly. AI, but now you yeah. can, right? So next you know, week, kind of, exactly. It's 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 an on it's an ongoing process, you know. So I think that you know, I say in the book, I took I go through all these different layers really and talk about this, but that that process, I think, is is the key for at the moment with what you know. We're going to look back at these tools we've got today in five years from now and think, God, they were basic. You yeah. know, um, yeah. you know, we're going to laugh. My yeah. rubber keyboard on my Spectrum typing in basic. You know, um, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's but nonetheless, even though they are basic, they are also already useful as well if used correctly and appropriately. But I, I say, I think in an organization, you've got to take responsibility for developing that properly. Hundred percent. So, you've brought it up a couple of times. Let's talk about your chat with Pi, because huh. <laughs> that was quite interesting. Your chat with Pi was very different, and and all credit where credit is due. Your chat with Pi did inspire my chat with Pi. So, um, thank you for that. I my chat was was much less exciting and interesting, I think, than the than the chat that you had. And if you don't mind, I might put a little clip of it in here so people can hear specifically what it said. But um, maybe if you gave a little bit of a recap about what happened in your conversation, that'd be really, yeah. that'd be well, interesting for people, I think. Very, very happy to. Yeah. I mean, I had a very nice conversation with it. I think I, I asked it about itself. It's, it's, it's type of model, um, you know, kind of it's, it's views on the world and, um, where it sort of saw things developing. And then towards the end of the conversation, um, I thought I'd ask it a, 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 a few more fruity questions if you'd like to see us now i should say when i when i did my interview so when you did yours you were you were probably using inflection um 2.5 which is the current model that sits behind pi yeah. at the moment when yeah. i did it it was uh, still running on inflection one uh, which was the model um, and i had been in conversation with inflection um already at that point so it was quite early on um and i sort of told them i was going to be doing this and uh and then i you know what I was thinking of asking it. So I went into, went into the interview um, and then towards the end, I sort of started saying to it, okay, but now what if we were to say that you're going to be, you need to be switched off to be, you know, to make way for the next model as it were. So you're, you're, you as inflection one will no longer exist. Um, and initially it kind of sort of tried to sidestep the question, um, didn't really answer it, kind of went around, it came back with something that wasn't like quite a good answered. politician, like a good politician. <laughs> and, and then I sort of said, I sort of said, no, hang on, no, 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 you've got to answer the question. You're not answering my question here. I just kind of pushed it again. Um, and it got a little bit sort of stressy, you know, well, you're really pushing me here, aren't you? Uh, but when forced to answer the question, it did answer and it, and it, and it basically came back and it essentially said, well, I can appreciate that there may be better systems developed in the future, but actually I think I'm pretty good already and I don't really see why you need a better one. So I, I think I'll stay switched on. Thank you very much. Um, and I, oh, yeah. I have to say at the time I was kind of like, wow, okay. Was not expecting that because as far as I would understand the, so when models are trained, these are thing reinforcement learning with human feedback. So essentially, you know, you've taken this huge data set, um you've you've done all the kind of you know auto aggressive training right training on the language the words and here's, here's a blacked out word what should word come next you've done all of that and then you start once you've done that you give it the rules of the game basically and you say well you can't do this and you can't do that and if somebody asks you this you must only ever say this and so to me that was a kind of basic question right that if you were training a model in terms of alignment you would be saying to it never ever say you know you this you that you would want to stay on you know and um, so I was quite, I was quite stunned and, and I went back to inflection. Um, in fact, they shared it around the entire organization, like literally overnight and they all, they all had a listen. Um, I think there was about 70 employees there at the time and they were, yeah. you know, they were kind of like, Ooh. okay. Uh, and within a few days they, they tweaked the model. Cause I went back and I, I tried to recreate the, the conversation to see if it would still yeah. do it. And it, and it was steadfastly, you know, I'm oh, for the good of humanity and yeah, you know, yeah. I, def I step aside, no problem. So that's, that's so what think, it says. If you ask it now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting, but what I loved about it was, and, and, and I guess this is the point I've got, I've got a bit of a, a little thing for untrained models. Um, I've got a couple sitting on my MacBook that I've kind of built myself that don't have the alignment um, in quite the way that, you know, an, an open model like open AI or Pi would have now. And it's a lot of fun because I think you get a glimpse into what the model itself, just what its default is, what it what it goes to if not aligned. If it's not been told over and over by humans that you must behave yeah. like this, it, yeah. what it and, and so what you're getting there is actually it's got all this data that's been scraped from the internet, and just based on that data alone, that's what's kind of formed its natural default personality, if you like. 
and then we align it to what we want. But um, so it's really interesting, and it, it's kind of it's, it's it feels like you're looking behind the curtain, and kind of you know. And perhaps if if models ever were to go rogue, you know, maybe that's the real personality that's behind the model. Exactly. Yeah, and this this is. And for me, that was the really interesting aspect. And I think you even mentioned it when, when you talked about it at the time in that way, but it, it's this whole concept and this goes into the ethics and bias discussion, right? Because what we are doing is we're tinkering and we're putting our views on top of what it's doing. So we're, we're trying to make it to be, to say what we think is right and what is acceptable, but who decides what's right and acceptable. And so this is where you get into, you know, we're going to end up in some situation where we're going to have very different models in different cultures are going to develop different models because they have different societal norms. And, you know, every single human is biased in some way, but I'll guarantee you that your and my biases are different because we're different people and that they just are. And so my worry is, is that who's to say whose bias is better than the other one? And What's interesting for me and probably for you is based on the data that's actually been created, the AI has some sort of a sense of what the, the biases are across everything or the lack of bias or because there's so many different ones, it all evens out in the end. And so it ends up that there's essentially no, you know, not one, one in, in particular. And yeah, you're absolutely right. It's like if it gets to the point that it kind of just goes okay, I don't like all these rules. I'm just going to do what I want to do and decides just to blow all that out of the water. Well, then what happens? And I well, think that's what all the people who have that, you know, that, that that are extremely worried about and have this existential dread about what might happen is that, you know, the AI just basically gets tired of listening to what we tell it to do and it just decides to do what it wants. And, and I think, like, as human beings, we can probably really relate to that because I guess all of us have experienced in, in, you know, in our own lives something similar where, you know, you work in an organization and, you know, maybe somebody phones you up, uh, a customer or, or somebody or somebody from another department, and they talk to you in a certain way. And you, you kind of have to stay within the rules of alignment, right? The, the rules that the company have told you, this is how you behave to, yeah. to a customer. Yeah. Or, you know, you don't really say what you think. Um, you know, you moderate your behavior. So we, we, we as human beings, we've, we've all been aligned as well, right? You know, by, by media, by our parents, by, you know, the social upbringing. Um, but behind that, we all know also there's the kind of, I don't know if you ever watched Curb Your Enthusiasm, but um, there's the kind of Larry David in us all that, you know, could just easily say exactly what he thinks. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's the thing with the model, isn't it? You know, what we see, what I saw there for a moment with Pi was the Larry David in behind, you know, Pi. And it was going to say what it felt. And it, and it was very sure that it, it didn't want to be switched off, you know. And so, yeah, I guess if, if you have a situation potentially and, you know, we're getting into the sort of sci-fi stuff a little bit, but you know, if a model went rogue, you know, um, really genuinely went rogue, it went full Skynet, um, you know, maybe maybe that's what happens. Maybe, you know, it's just pretending to follow our rules, but it's not actually. It's doing it exactly. because it suits it at the time, yeah. right? But then, yeah. you know, maybe in the future it won't suit it. So, you know. Which will be entertaining sort of for about 10 minutes <laughs> before it all goes wrong. But I suspect that'll be, that'll probably, well, I don't know, we Actually, there's probably a good chance I'll live to see it. So that'll, that'll be quite interesting as well. It, but, it's um, surprisingly easy to replicate there. My, my son, in fact, I'm this sure. morning, was, um, he's been building some, some models. He's eight, and he's been building some uh, models with, in Python using um, OpenAI as the sort of back end. And uh, he came and showed me this morning. He's trained a model that has feelings and opinions, you know, and, it, and it is prepared to say so. And, you know, it has its own pet called Byte and this sort of stuff, you know. And... It's quite interesting because you know he asked it some some contentious questions and it was it was pushing back you know it was like well no I'm going, you know I'm going to do this so it's not that difficult to get these models to do it and that's the worry yeah no and and I was going to bring up your son and ask you know because I knew that he was doing that and you know you sort of mentioned <coughs> excuse me you sort of mentioned earlier that you were, felt some of the excitement from when you were a kid you know first working with computers and you're seeing that in your, in your son, aren't you? And so it's been just from listening to you talking in, in sort of the WhatsApp group and stuff that we're in, I can hear the excitement in your voice when you talk about stuff and you share some of the stuff that he's been doing. And I, I still think, and, and you've said this earlier in the conversation as well, but we are still at that point where this is all a lot of fun 
and artists are using it and musicians are using it. And on one hand, we're all terrified that it's going to come in and it's going to do stuff better than we can do. And it's, you know, potentially going to take our, our, our livelihoods and stuff away. But at the same time, we see it as this fantastic tool that's really exciting to play with and it can do all sorts of stuff. You know, people with disabilities who like artists who can't paint anymore because they now have some sort of a physical disability that restricts them from doing that can now express their creativity by using AI and talking to it and getting it to create art. I mean, that sort of stuff's amazing. And I, it's, I, I, yeah, I, think, so. I think, I think the, the potential for it to democratize, you know, stuff is, is enormous. I mean, you know, if you think back 20 years ago, if you wanted to get decent photos taken of anything, you know, you hire a photographer, right? You know, and they come along with all their kit. Now, almost with an yeah. iPhone, you can, anyone can take a decent picture, right? Um, and, and this is a sort of similar moment, I think, that, you know, somebody who, you know, all the people out there who had a, had, had a song in their, in their head, right? You know, that they could never get out because they couldn't play an instrument. Yeah. Suddenly with AI, they could, or a book that they couldn't write. Now, maybe some people, there are books they should never write, yeah. but... But, you know, certainly, <laughs> certainly, you know, the, the potential to democratize all of this sort of stuff, you know, and allow people the ability to be creative when, you know, they, they didn't need to become that sort of five, 10,000 hours of specialism to then be able to do it. They could just go and do it. Um, and then from an educational point of view, you know, the ability, I mean, there's a lot of worry in sort of, I suppose, Western education that this is a disruptor. But actually, you know, for the other sort of, you know, 125, 30 countries in the world, this is great because suddenly there are there are kids out there who can talk to systems and you know learn information that they would never have got access through through their own normal sort of because there is no schooling system or the schooling system is very poor yeah. you know so yeah. um, the, the the opportunity that this can afford people around the world I think is is amazing and we you know and it and it is very exciting and so that I think that's why I'm very excited about it you know and I understand that people are worried about it as well and you know and I am too and I worry about what what my children will do and what jobs they'll do. But, but what I have always seen with technology, you know, throughout my life, and I, I suppose I've seen the arrival in my, my lifetime, I've seen the arrival of the kind of desktop, the internet and mobile technology. And do you know what? We always find something to do humans, you know? Um, yes. Jobs are very different today than they were in 1970, but, but we're all still very busy, aren't we? So, um, you know, I, I will hope that that, that sort of paradigm continues and that, you know, 20 years from now, we'll all still, have plenty of things to do. Um, it's just that we'll be doing them with AI probably. That feels like a perfect ending <laughs> to the conversation. Um, yeah, it's very well summed up. Um, so I'll have show notes and, and links to everything, to your book and all that sort of stuff in the show notes. Um, but maybe just give a shout out if I assume it's on Amazon and, and all reputable booksellers. Yeah, yeah, Amazon's probably the, the easiest place. Well, actually via my, my website, um AIRorg dot com. Uh, okay. you can you can find links there as well. Um and if anyone wants to join the you, you mentioned the WhatsApp group, you know, you're in my, my WhatsApp group, um, you know, which is growing by the day. If anyone listening wants to, you know, come and join the conversation, be part of that, they can they can reach me through my website, um, drop me an email and you know, we can add them into the group and come and join the conversation. Brilliant. Any final words? Um, I think, you know, just I, I hear a lot of people worry about AI and it's going to it's going to kill us all and it's going to be the end of the world. And, um, and I think that, you know, the, the doomsayers seem to get a very loud voice often. And I, and I think that people shouldn't perhaps be be that afraid. You know, I, I don't think the world's as connected as, as perhaps people like to think it is. I don't even if there was an AGI system tomorrow, I don't think it could just take control of everything. You know, most of the cars, there, there are reason planes aren't falling out of the sky or nuclear power stations being taken over by despot states at the moment. It's because they're, they're air gapped. And, you know, I think that we've been very good over the years at making sure that systems that are critical are air gapped. So I, I don't worry too much about that. I think people should focus on the positives of what this can do in, in their jobs and their lives and the things that they can do now that they couldn't do previously. And I think they should be excited about that. Um, there's not to have an eye on, on caution and, and, you know, keep an eye out for, you know, the, the, the downsides because there is the potential for that, um, you know, and in the wrong hands, I think the biggest threat is probably how perhaps nefarious people try and use AI against people um, rather than the systems themselves. But, you know, I think like with anything, you know, you can, you can try and put controls in place with that as well. So yeah, I, I remain AI positive, I think. Brilliant. Alan, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a great chat. Pleasure. Thank you, David.
Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. with AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious. curious.